up on the block today, newly released 11th gen desktop processors. The i9 11900K and the i5 11600K sent to me from on high by Intel. Oh, and also the i7, which I picked up at retail. These are the new desktop class processors. 11th generation from Intel. Codename Rocket Lake. Rocket Lake. 14 nanometer. 14 nanometer ain't the kind of process to be raised in a new microarchitecture. In fact, it's hot as heck. And there's, there's no stock to buy them, even if you did want them. It's just the clock speeds, a, a bit weak. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time before an advanced process Intel can find. It's not the 10 core, it's the eight, that's all. Oh, no, 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 it's Rocket Lake. Burning out all the VRMs with adaptive boost. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. Anyway, this new microarchitecture is a big change from past generations. 19% IPC uplift advertised by Intel in their marketing slides over the 10900K and new boost strategies meant that my expectations for this CPU were really pretty high. Our test system is based around the Arctic Freezer 2 420 CPU cooler. This is the minimum cooling that I'd recommend for the i9 CPU if you're gonna go off script and actually use Active Boost for reasons that I'm gonna explain. Now, our testing was conducted with Intel's new Adaptive Boost on, not off, which is the default off. It's basically free performance. It's a sort of multi-core enhancement light, and we need to talk a lot more about that but I wanted to be upfront because my results are probably gonna be different from everybody else's because Adaptive Boost was on. Storage was either the Samsung 980 Pro PCI Express 4 or the Sabrent Rocket 4 terabytes. That was what was being tested. For graphics, we mainly used the MSI Supreme 3090 and also the RX 6900 XT. The motherboard, the main motherboard has the ROG Asus Hero 13. That's this one. There's some killer boards, and I've got a ton of content coming up with these killer boards. I've also got this MSI EK motherboard for the custom loop and the mono block. I highly recommend this too, because hey, custom loop, the ASRock Tai Chi Z590, the Velocita. We've got a lot of options for motherboards and more content. So get subscribed, you know, stay tuned for that. It's, it's really exciting because hey, new motherboards and PCI Express 4 and new chipsets and stuff like that. But let's talk about what's new with the processors first. Now Intel, Intel's added four more PCI Express lanes. What? Yes, dedicated storage PCI Express 4.0 lanes. Oh, and they've also widened the chipset link to PCI 3.0 by eight, which really is adding a ton of IO bandwidth to the platform overall. That's an exciting and welcome change. Believe me, because now, you know, even a cheap NVMe would bottleneck your DMI link, but now, not, not so much now. Now, good news, bad news. These new chips will work on Z490 motherboards, and some Z490 motherboards do actually have support for PCI Express 4 right out of the box. Mostly it's just the NVMe slot though, not the graphics card slot, because the CPUs weren't available for testing. So if you get a Z490 board, well, you probably shouldn't be upgrading anyway if you've already got Z490, I mean, come on. But if you see a Z490 board that's on sale and you're not gonna run PCI Express 4, you know, something to consider. Our Intel Z590 test systems had no trouble keeping up with our Gen 4 Samsung 980 Pro. It's nice to have dedicated fast storage lanes on the new Rocket Lake processors, whether you're using Z490, depends on the motherboard, or Z590. Pretty much all motherboards have that, at least all that I'm, that I'm aware of. A new microarchitecture, fast PCI Express 4 storage lanes, no doubt that is what contributed significantly to our PC mark score, which is one of the rare places where this Intel platform really pulls ahead of the competition. What's happening in this specific test really shows Intel's best strength with the new microarchitecture. It's very low latency. PC mark aims to simulate ordinary-ish desktop computer usage stuff and uh, having a low latency round trip from storage to CPU to memory really drives up the score here. Um, storage devices like Intel Optane, 
which have even lower latency than NAND flash that I used for the testing, would really also boost the score a lot. And while Intel has data center PCI Express 4.0 Optane solutions, there haven't been, you know, there's not even been a whiff or a hint of new PCI Express 4 enthusiast Optane options. I think that's a real shame, and this is a potential differentiator for Intel because PCI Express 4 directly into the CPU with Optane, I think it would've been awesome. But do I think that alone would have been enough for Intel to retake the gaming crown? Uh, well, sorta, kinda, maybe. Actually, I was expecting a little better performance for 1080p gaming, to be honest. AMD's platform has inherently higher latency because of the chiplet architecture, and a majority of this latency is offset by other design choices that AMD has made. Larger cache, better branch predictor, other really cool stuff under the hood, and I.O., on the other hand, is much more difficult to hide the platform latency because it's I.O., it's not CPU instructions. Look ahead's not gonna really help you. With high-end GPUs like the RTX 3090 and the RX 6900 XT, one might expect the platform to deliver significantly higher frame rates at 1080p. The reality, however, is that the performance at 1080p with these high-end cards is almost the same as 1440p, and overall, it's really about the same as the competition, these lower resolutions with these really fast graphics cards. It really depends on the game, and Intel can lead by about 10%, but um, it's a little bit of a wash. I mean, don't get me wrong, overall, it's a great performer in games if you're using something that older than say like an 8700K, it could be well worth the money to upgrade. But it's a relatively small upgrade over Intel's own 10900K in a lot of cases. Yeah, I mean the new eight core CPU keeping pace with the old 10 core CPU, that's, that's really good. Uh, Intel touts at least three different boost technologies, which is part of what helps them do that. And they're wringing every last drop of performance out of that silicon that you can possibly get. Uh, it's, it's a lot more than they've done in the past. There's thermal velocity boost and turbo boost max 3.0. These depend on the CPU a little bit as to whether or not you get that feature, as well as adaptive boost. Adaptive boost is new, it's cool. It's like multi-core enhancement, uh, light, I guess. How much it gives you is gonna vary from chip to chip, but Intel's slide shows that it's meant to give you the most performance bump in heavier-ish multi-core workloads. Most of their boost now has been on you know one or two cores, that was their focus. So this affects benchmarks a little more than games, it depends on the game. Uh, and it's also off by default, because I think not every chip will be able to sustain this level of power delivery and overclocking. And because you also need really beefy cooling, hence my Arctic Freezer 2 recommendation. When we're talking about power consumption, this thing really is about 130 watts TDP in, in my measurements uh, when you're sticking exactly to the Intel specs. But at 5.1 gigahertz all core, which is I think what you can expect of just about every i9, uh, it's more like 260 watts through the CPU. And that needs a lot of cooling because ideally these boost algorithms work best when you can keep the CPU under 70 degrees C. And that's no easy feat. So thanks Arctic. Now I actually also had the cryo cooler from Intel and Cooler Master. That's an easy sub ambient cooling option. It's got a Peltier, you know, thermoelectric cooler, uh, and it's gonna, you know, really bring that CPU temperature down. However, Intel locked the software to prevent you from using it on an unsupported processor, and they forgot to add Rocket Lake CPUs in time. That's probably fixed by now, but it wasn't fixed when I was working on this material, which was super frustrating. Get subscribed if you want me to go through that in sub-zero mode on the 11th gen Intel, because I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna do it if I have to get out the hex editor to do it. There just wasn't time before this, uh, this review. The memory speed has also been bumped to DDR4 3200, and you have per-core hyper-threading control now. You can give up hyper-threading on some of your cores for more thermal and power headroom. Technically, the memory speed is 2933 for the lowest latency one-to-one -one mode, and 3200 in a kind of asynchronous mode is supported. You can also overclock. Now, I messed around with memory overclocking a ton. There is this idea of gear one and gear two. So DDR4 3200 versus DDR4 2933. Both 2933 and 3200 are the highest speeds officially supported, but the 3200 mode operates the memory subsystem asynchronously. So when I overclocked, I overclocked up to 3800, and that only worked on the ASRock board. <laughs> so I think the ASRock board is a real champ for memory overclocking. 
but overall, it really didn't widen the gap with the competition significantly, even around 1080p, but it did improve some benchmarks. And that'll be a video for another day, I'm afraid. Most gaming things that, you know, gamer-oriented things, I guess, 2933 is probably the configuration that you wanna run, especially if you can get tighter timings than your memory kit offers. These changes signal to me that Intel has really pulled out all the stops to claw uh, you know, every little bit of gaming performance that they possibly can from all the different corners of the CPU. Truly multi-core you know, workloads, this eight core CPU can't touch a 12 core or a 16 core CPU from, from the competition. It's just, it's just not powerful enough. It also brings new XE graphics, which means new and improved quick sync, which is nice because quick sync is actually used for some video acceleration stuff, which is awesome. Now the iGPU maxes out at HDMI 2.0B, so you're not gonna get any HDMI 2.1, but they claim that it supports up to two 5K displays now at 60 Hertz, so maybe you get a little bit more pixel clock bandwidth. It also seems to me that with the Adobe Suite specifically, QuickSync is more reliable than even, you know, some things like rendering with discrete GPUs, gaming GPUs anyway, but that's a little bit more furrowed brow directed toward Adobe you know, WTF, then a thumbs up toward Intel because why would the quick sync stuff be more stable than, I mean, who, who's not talking to who? I don't understand. Oh, and before I forget, AVX 512. AVX 512 is in the house with the 11th gen Intel. Uh, that means it should open up Intel's deep learning boost for games. Maybe if Gabe Noel gets involved, it means we'll see modern enemy AI as groundbreaking as Half-Life's enemy AI was way back when Half-Life was released which is quite a long time ago. With all this new stuff, I was hoping that, you know, for Linux users, I could give GVTG a go, but it seems like that's been disabled for the iGPU. I really just wanted to run a couple of virtual machines with graphics acceleration. Is that too much to ask? But alas, it's not working yet. Although it may just be missing libraries because this was, you know, sort of pre-launch. So I'm gonna stay tuned for that. Look out for that on the Linux channel. Like the last several generations, the CPU PCIe lanes also do not break down into separate IO MMU groups, at least on the Hero, which is what I did most of my testing on, uh, with the Press BIOS. If you're thinking about building a VFIO machine around these processors, you know, bummer, since the platform has so much PCIe bandwidth now, it, it might actually be viable. And, you know, it, the cores are faster, even though you've only got eight of them, it's pretty good. So how does the i5 and the i7 fit here? Well, you do get that 19% IPC uplift on those CPU cores, which is great. And they have weaker overall clocks than the i9, which is not as great. I wish the clocks were a little higher on the i7. As Intel's slide indicates, you know, it's clear that you don't get the same, you know, level of boost in the fanciest boost algorithms, except on the most expensive cores or the most expensive CPUs. But nevertheless, that i7 can hit five gigahertz, all core, pretty stable. That's manual overclock though. I think the Arctic cooler has probably a large part of the uh, responsibility for that. I've also got the Asus ITX motherboard here, Z590, and I'm gonna try to do a small form factor build around that i5, six cores. I mean, overall, these CPUs, they're not bad. They are maybe not up to Intel's usual high standards, but you can tell a lot of men and women have really put a lot of work into these processors because the landscape in CPUs is getting pretty competitive. I'm not just talking about AMD, I'm, I'm also thinking about Apple with the M1 and ARM for Windows, and that's at the mobile side, but ARM on the server is also coming. This is more middle of the market. But with Intel's recent announcements, it sounds like they're poised for big changes and bold strategies, which is, uh, I think they're gonna need that. We know that the Intel MSRP on these parts range from 539 for the i9 to a very reasonable $262 for the i5. So I think the i5, for me, is clearly the best overall deal for a gaming PC this generation among those processors, especially with the stock 4.9 gigahertz boost and given that you can probably manually get an all-core overclock of five gigahertz, I'd say, with most chips, with excellent cooling, of course. The i7 11700K for $400 might be a better deal than the i9 for most workloads, but you can almost be sure that you're not gonna achieve stability of five gigahertz and beyond if you do overclock, because you know the better bend parts will have almost certainly become an i9. Things may get better later in the product life cycle. If you are looking at this video and the, the 11700K has been out for a year, chances are it's gonna be a better overclocker. That's just how it works. I also can't help but notice my local retailers have a lot of 10th generation CPUs. I mean, you know, honestly, if you've got your heart set on an Intel build, 
you wouldn't be going wrong with the 10850K either, especially if you aren't finding the 11th generation parts in stock. You give up those dedicated PCI Express 4 storage lanes, and there's no PCI Express 4 at all, but you know, that's really, to me, the biggest differentiator between 10th and 11th generation. I mean, it's a completely different microarchitecture, but the performance is really not a lot different, except at 1080p, but to get that performance difference, you need a higher-end video card. You're not gonna be running 1080p anyway, if that makes sense. Is this CPU right for you or your next build? Eh, it depends. I like the i5, but, you know, it really mostly comes down to pricing. At this point, any disappointment one might have around these products is because one might have expected more from Intel with these kinds of big changes. I mean, it's a new microarchitecture. The gaming performance is actually pretty solid across the board, and the PC Mark, you know, productivity score really that's that's best in class for ordinary desktop tasks. But that's a lot of qualifiers. And one thing we can be sure of, we'll look back on these processors as sort of the heralds of the start of Mr. Pat Gelsinger's uh, time at Intel, I guess. And we already know the big bold changes are coming down the pipeline, so that's exciting. So I guess I've strayed a bit here, but it's complex. Let's discuss you, your build, and what you want to do, and how I can help in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.